are so excited today to be joined by two phenomenal writers from UNC Asheville's English department. And as always, we are grateful to Malacrops for providing us with this virtual space. Um, before we get started, just a few quick announcements. Um, the first is just a brief content warning uh, for our featured fiction piece today. Since it is in the horror genre and very seasonally appropriate, um, it contains some descriptions of blood and gore and a mild scene of violence and attempted sexual assault. So please continue at your own discretion. Our second announcement is to keep an eye on our website for our spring 2022 classes. They aren't posted yet, but I hope to have them up by November, so you'll have plenty of time to register before they start in February. And you can find course descriptions, registration information, all of that is on our website, and that is greatsmokies.unca.edu. So now on with the reading. Our first reader today is Cassandra Sigman. Cassandra is the winner of the Top Griot Scholarship for the Strongest Student of Poetry and a senior majoring in English with a concentration in creative writing. She enjoys writing both fiction and poetry and is currently working on a novel and a poetry collection. She recently had a poem published in Atlantis Magazine and a microfiction piece published in the Coastal Shelf Literary Magazine. Besides creative writing, Cassandra also works as a freelancer in content writing and social media marketing and has a blog on Medium. She enjoys the freedom and flexibility of working online. In addition, she also loves long road trips, playing violin, and hiking barefoot. So without further ado, Cassandra. Thank you. I'm very excited to be here, and I've just got a few poems that I've pulled together for this reading, so hopefully you enjoy. Um, so the first one I have is Red Clay, and just to give you some context for this poem, I'm from Graham, North Carolina. That's my hometown. It's about three hours east of Asheville. And lately there's been a lot of new housing developments in the area, and which has been really sad for me because a lot of the forest has been cut down to make room for more houses. And so this is sort of a poem that I wrote in response to that. Red Clay. You throw money at the land and sprout houses and driveways and fences stitched into the red clay, my clay. Sharp angles don't belong in nature, don't belong anywhere, especially not here. Twain said the world doesn't owe you anything, and he was right. The dirt was here first. You don't get to rip away the life and dig around for favors. All the softness is shrinking because you cover and cover and cover it up until the mud is oozing out of a patchwork shell, like the earth needs armor. It shouldn't. But in the South, when you stab the land, it bleeds. The next one I have is us. I was a sapling in a graveyard and you were immortal. We unfurled on the bluff under the breath of dusk when the grass was still warm and you held me with the gentleness of the river that flowed beneath us. As the sunset washed away, a thousand stars drifted from the night sky and settled on the skyline. Our fingers traced the horizon, converging on the brightest light. That was us. Third, I have Summer Pond. You lower your hands into the cool, still water and shiver in the darkness of the shallow depths. Further still you reach until you touch the softness, stroke the lymph algae floating out in chaotic sun-touched tentacles, like the warmth on your bare arms. You squeeze the slick mud, let it slide softly away, dissipate into nothing. Stir the leaves at the bottom, cluttering the floor like a mosaic of papers, shredded, shriveled, wet. The moist perfume of decay rises through the fluid, bubbles through the broad surface. Somewhere there are fish, slender scaly creatures that weave among branches, home in the upside down trees veiled in knobby slime. Frogs too, hushed at your footsteps, they will leap away, softly rocketing through space, gone in a shudder. The next poem I have is called Wildfire, and it was inspired by how the wildfires in the West, on the Western coast have gotten increasingly bad in the past few years. Um, as Lily mentioned, I really love taking road trips. And so I've been out to like California and Oregon several times, and I really love the Western US. And so it's been really sad to see large areas get burned up, especially in these past two years. Um, and I'm not sure if I can share my screen. Um, I can't, but just to give you some context right now, um, just this past month, a lot of giant sequoias were burned up in Sequoia National Park um, due to the windy fire. Um, earlier last year, I think was the Castle Fire, which burned down a lot of sequoias. So there's just been a lot of destruction on the West Coast due to fires lately. And so that inspired this poem. 
Oh, okay. Um, yeah, so this is just a photo of the Windy Fire and one of the sequoias burning pretty high up. So I just wanna share that to give some context. Um, so yeah, so wildfire. The West is crumbling up in flames. The trees are sunk into themselves. Death choke, wood smoke, the skies withholding autumn rains. I hear the dooming dark of bells, bell toll, grave hole. I see the orange blot out the ground to smother history in ash. Lost names fuel flames, and while the sparks spin, twirling round, the gods from Mount Olympus laugh, burn deep, slow sleep. The tents unzip into the haze, into the glow of bubble lights, into the engines rumbling, these fragile California nights. Unfolding in the smoky dew, she slowly rubs her swollen hands, the firemen thud in heavy boots throughout the maze of tents and vans. Nine hours a day, the laundress works, the generators growl and purr, the laundry trailer vibrates as the washers and the dryers were, and while the world is swept by flames, she folds the firefighter's shirts, a stack of clothing freshly washed brings healing to a world of hurt. A dusting of ash clings to your skin and your hair, you old gray person. The next poem I have is Fall Scenery. These hands that held you are smoking at the edges, fingertips curling into flame and raised against the autumn sky to see them fall. Burnt up people jerked upright and wound into a carousel, falling voicelessly, falling crumpled onto the streets. Step around the stamp of my flattened body, stain of my blood on the sidewalk, break us up, a spark and we are ignited, dismantled by the wind, Memories blurring as we disintegrate into ash. This next poem is one of my more recent poems and it's called A Crow on Wednesdays. I am a crow on Wednesdays and other days disguised as a girl. Mornings I collect the feathers shed beneath my quilt, stick them in a jar, plume up. I hop down sidewalks on Thursdays, notice every crack, speck, blade of grass, candy wrapper. My footprints at the beach have claws, but I pretend they're seagull tracks. Fridays, I memorize every passing face, fixed forever in my gaze, charred mass of desire and uncertainty. Eyes are particularly fascinating, little flashes of color pitted with black, always black. Saturdays, I cock my head and listen to the neighbors, Blah, 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 stomp, crash, scream. Still shedding, still molting, more feathers crumpled in my sheets. I flounder through Sundays, flapping against the walls, tracing shadow lines on the ceiling. I spend hours polishing my rings, spinning them in the sunlight to see them shine. Mondays, I claw against the windows, have to paint over the scratches, layer slapped over layer. Time is fluid, is hot, is boiling, is rupturing and spilling in all directions. Tuesday nights, I don't bother to wear clothes or even go to bed at all. I've got a bowl to hold the moonlight and I box it up for the moonless nights. Then Wednesdays, I split open, dark feathered creature ripping through the skin. I'm trying to get closer to the sun, trying to catch it before I end. Had my wings clipped after death, broke the surface on the way down. The next poem I have lined up is a golden shovel poem. So basically a golden shovel poem follows a really interesting form. You basically, you take a small poem written by someone else and you have to use each of the words in that poem as the words at the end of each of the lines in your poem. So the poem that was inspiration for this one, which is called Rain Walking, um, is Jack Kerouac's poem, The Bottoms of My Shoes. And so his poem reads, the bottom of my shoes are clean from walking in the rain. So basically each of the words in his short poem are used at the end of the lines in my poem. So rain walking. When I think about the time spent on our bottoms, I am reminded of all that is wrong with my life and how I hate shoes. How awful that we are obsessed with being clean. You see, where I come from, I go barefoot walking to let the mud seep in, and I shower in the breathtaking summer rain. The next poem is from the book in the corner. 
She doesn't remember names, not even mine. It's very small, the thin line that yet remains, a paper cut refusing to bleed or seal. Do memories ever heal? It's confusing the way fantasy can wound. We can center in our longing to enter a world doomed. Perhaps we want harmless love, which can't exist. Even my small love persists to remind of the day I dared to pierce her when she held me. My pages stained and sweaty as a splinter of memory stained colors twisted its way to her soul. Home among a thousand others. Second to last, uh, I have still where you left me. A scream with every breath calling you back. Patience will be my death and I will stand on the shore waiting for you, mourning in black till the darkness brands itself into my bones. Then I will stand on the shore dying for you. A crumbling empire cries, refusing to fall. Hoping is my demise, but I will stand on the shore watching for you, stooping to crawl till the salt is crushed and piled on my gravestone. Still, I will stand on the shore fighting for you. Let the earth swallow me some other day. And then I'm down to my last poem, which is Adeli. And this is sort of more of an environmental poem about the effects of global warming, uh, focusing specifically on the Adelie penguin. I feel you in a sound, a thousand swelling prayers slicked with oil and weighted with greenhouse fumes, a thousand prayers burned with smoky incense. I feel you in the wet, in the shivering bunch of Adelie feathers lying in a puddle it used to be a nest. When I pick up your chick, he trembles. Heartbeat thud, thud, thud. Sweaty palms, please hold on. Thud, thud, thud. Like holding a colorless rainbow. Warmth diffusing, bleeding out. I feel your home, crystal spiky fresh. Water lattice tumbling or spilling. You decide. Rumble, ripple deep. All the world's afloat. Cold, cold dive spiral down. Wind breath shredded into the sea. What a soggy mess, shrouding the unmollusked ship mast, cemetery or museum sprouting from the bottom, empty fishless sea. My sorrow for you is like the glow of the aurora australis as it dances above Antarctica, then a waterlogged tangle of corpses, then the scattering of bones across the iceless frontier. So that's all I had selected for today. Thank you for listening. I'll turn it back over to Lily. Thank you so much. Those are all beautiful and fantastic. I always think it's so fun to hear the inspiration for those, especially your environmental ones like the sequoias and the last one about the penguins. Like that's really fascinating to me. Um, and I always enjoy learning new things from the readers. I'd never heard of a golden shovel poem. So that was really cool. Thank you so much. So our second reader today is Elizabeth DeVito. And Elizabeth is the winner of the Comfort Scholarship for the Most Promising Student in Creative Writing. And she's a senior majoring in English with a concentration in creative writing. She's the winner of the 2021 Adventure Bound Books Writing Contest. And she has a winning short story collection, uh, Animal Eyes and Other Short Stories that will be published later this year. She enjoys dark stories, especially in the horror and thriller genres, and is currently working on a novel um, in one of each at the moment. She is currently an intern at WNC Magazine, and when she's not writing, she enjoys reading, theater, and drinking copious amounts of sweet iced tea. So, Elizabeth. All right, thank you. Um, so I'm going to be reading a sort of condensed version of a, a short horror story that I wrote for my senior thesis. It's called My Mother Tried to Warn Me, and it is inspired by my love for writers like Angela Carter and Carmen Maria Machado and my fascination with the original versions of fairy tales, specifically the much darker pre-Disney versions that have a surprising amount of suspense and horror elements to them. So I will get started on that. So my mother tried to warn me. Growing up, my mother told me people eat her stories. My earliest memory is her face over my crib and she'd speak in a voice low enough so my father couldn't hear. She told me about wolves who ate girls, queens who ate princesses and witches who ate children. I got used to thinking of, and thinking of them as just that, people eater stories. It wouldn't be until I was older that I learned most people call them fairy tales. My mother never spared me the effects of these stories. My bedroom became a place of danger a place of faces in the windows, growls under the bed. If I asked my mother if there was a monster hiding in my closet, her answer would have most likely been probably. 
So when my mother died, the stories were what she left me. My inheritance was a childhood full of visions of people with blood dripping down their lips and the promise that they were for my own good. My mother didn't have a lot of friends. Her interactions with others could best be described as minimal. She was polite, laughed when she was supposed to, frowned when she was supposed to, but she was distant and disinterested in most people. Her, fu her funeral consisted of me, my father, and stepmother. My father had met stepmother in the, year, in the later years of my mother's illness, the days when her death became more certain. Stepmother wept as they lowered the casket into the ground. She pressed a tissue to her nose as if she personally knew the woman who garnered a funeral of three. As the mortician started throwing dirt on my mother, stepmother wrapped an arm around my shoulders. I'm so sorry, sweetheart, she said. I promise I'll protect you as much as she would have wanted you to be protected. I nodded because that's how one is supposed to respond when comforted. But as we left the cemetery, stepmother's hand tucked delicately under my father's arm, I remembered that this is how people eat her story started. A daughter is separated from her mother. Mothers are always the first to die in these kinds of stories. A dead mother means the child will soon be devoured. Stepmother promised she would protect me as my mother did, but she was determined to be as unlike my mother as possible, starting with the stories she told me. When she asked me what kind of stories my mother read to me as a child, I told her the people eater stories. I started with the one about the queen who tried to eat her stepdaughter's organs, her heart, lung, and livers to be, liver to be exact, and was killed by being forced to dance in a pair of hot iron shoes. Stepmother's eyes grew wider with each new development. Those stories are not appropriate for children, she said of the people eater stories. Let's think of something more appropriate for a girl. So she gave me the version of the people eater stories most children read, the ones where people are rescued or escape or don't stay eaten for long. I was 13 and already knew these versions from schoolmates, but stepmother insisted on telling me them anyway, as if she could do, undo whatever my mother had inflicted upon me by telling me such nasty tales. I guess this was part of her protection promise. She also didn't like that I acted like my mother. I inherited my mother's distance and disinterest in most people, and she was determined to correct this. She blamed my mother's stories, accused them of punishing young heroines for just being nice. She worried this message would leave me alone and bitter. So instead she told me stories of girls who were rewarded for their compliance. The girls in her stories did not die because they were good. And even if their niceness brought them to bite into a stranger's ap poison apple, it would all work out in the end because they were good and good things happened to girls who were nice. Stepmother didn't realize what my mother's stories were for. And I couldn't argue with her because I wasn't sure myself. Even as I got older, I kept fumbling for what she was trying to teach me. I tried to find a lesson in the bloody teeth and dead daughters. All the while I did as stepmother instructed me. I did not shy away from people, even the ones whose eyes took their time down my body. I responded to anyone who prompted me, no matter the, or the question. I was nice to the boy in my class who dropped chew gum down my shirt. I did not resist when my step uncle pulled me into a hug and patted me on my lower back. If I was nice like stepmother said, everything would be fine. You'd think children would have more to gain from bedtime stories, but I wouldn't understand my mother's intentions until I was an adult. The understanding that stepmother's fairy tales prettied the truth, covered it with flora and fauna, and would do me no good when I left childhood behind. And like every good people leader story, it started with a girl and a hungry mouth. One of the lies fairy tales tell us is that there's always a huntsman. No matter what stomach you end up, in, up, end up in, there will always be a strong hand to pull you out. In my mother's telling of the story, there was no huntsman. When Red Riding Hood arrived at grandmother's house, the wolf ordered her to remove her clothes and get into bed with him. She did as she was told, throwing her red cloak into the fireplace, then crawling into bed, where the wolf proceeded to devour her. Stepmother told me the version everyone else knew, the version my schoolmates told me before the one where a huntsman arrives and cuts open the wolf's stomach, allowing Red and Grandmother to crawl out. No less gruesome, but happier, I guess. I tried to ask my mother about this once, why she never mentioned a huntsman. It was years before the diagnosis, years before stepmother. I remember we were in the kitchen. She was chopping meat for dinner. Because Little Red Riding Hood was a stupid little girl, she pointed the tip of her kitchen knife to my forehead, and you will not be a stupid little girl. I didn't understand what she meant until I found myself in the exact kind of trouble she knew I would wander into. This trouble came when I was a college freshman with an undeclared major and three roommates who decided that finishing our midterms 
was a cause for celebration. I wasn't much into parties, but I promised stepmother I would make friends and accepting their invitation to go out seemed like the only way to do it. There was a sorority house on the other side of campus that had a similar idea. And I, and I found myself on a Friday night with an unopened beer in my hand in a room full of people I'd seen around campus. I sat with my roommates on the couch while they mingled with anyone around. Across the living room, a group of boys cheered as two of them arm wrestled over the table. They did several rounds and each time the loser had to take a shot of Bacardi. They'd done over a dozen rounds and their arms were getting shakier. I could hear all of them chanting over the noise while a laptop in the corner played rap music off of someone's Spotify. The boys howled with their tongues out and saliva glistening from their teeth. They're cheating, you know. One of the guys my roommates had invited over was speaking to me now. I recognized him from environmental science class. Years of stepmother's conditioning kicked in and I snapped my head to the voice that demanded my attention. I turned to see him watching me watch the arm wrestlers. Are they, I asked. The huntsman nodded. Those Bacardi bottles are full of water, he said. One of those guys is only acting hammered so no one will know. Across the room, the same guy who won the last few rounds snapped his opponent's hand down and the whole pack cheered. It so it looks, I said. They only give Bacardi bottle to the girls, loosen them up so they can get laid faster. I glanced down at the beer in my hand and was grateful my roommates had brought our own drinks instead. I noticed a girl in the corner chair with a red solo cup in her hand and a doozy look in her eye. One of the boys by the table had been eyeing at her all night. You don't strike me as the kind of person who comes to these kinds of things, the huntsman said. I'm certainly not. I'm only here because a friend dragged me. I noticed he didn't have a drink in his hand. All I had seen him do all night was talk to anyone passing by, watching the action but never getting involved. He was still waiting for me to respond. I guess not, I said. Maybe every now and then. Well, if you ever get nervous at one of these things, just came out with me. I'm not one of those assholes who would do that to a girl. He eyed back at the girl in the chair. The guy from the table had lost interest in the arm wrestling contest and was now bent over her, asking if she was okay. My roommates had dispersed, wandered off to different parts of the house, having forgotten about me. I saw one of them down the hall. A boy pressed her against the wall, teeth to her neck. I think I'll just go now, I said. I stood up from the couch and the huntsman stood up with me. I'll walk you home, he said, then gave me a boyish smile. Maybe it was the lack of lighting or the secondhand smoke coming from the other room, but he was cute light brown curls and dimples. Stepmother's voice purred into my ears. He's such a nice young man. He's so nice to walk you home safe. It would be rude to turn him away. I kept picturing her scowling face as I refused. So I ignored the prickling on my neck and agreed. He followed me out of the house onto the path that led from one side of campus to the next. Despite it being Friday night, all midterms completed, no one, seemed, seemed, and no one else seemed out. The quad was dark and cool and one of the walkway lights flickered. The huntsman kept the conversation going. He asked me about my classes, my major, where I was from, everything you would ask someone in college. Undecided, I said. I admitted I didn't have a path. I'm taking a class on literature and folklore in the 19th century, he said. Right now we've made it to the Brothers Grimm. Our feet crunched on a scattering of leaves on the sidewalk and I could hear crickets in the bushes and frogs in nearby puddles. There was no other students to be found anywhere. For a place so empty, everything felt so loud. You know, the huntsman said to me, the original fairy tales were pretty fucked up. They weren't sweet and innocent like in Disney movies. I was tired and ready to go to bed, so I mumbled, that's neat. It's brutal. In the original Cinderella, the stepsisters cut their toes off to fit their feet into the glass slipper, and then a bunch of crows peck their eyes out as punishment for being vain and deceitful. Pretty fucked up, right? He told me all these stories the rest of the way to my dorm. He stopped right outside my door and gave me a look while I searched for my room key. You know, it's only 12.07, he said. Just because we left the party early doesn't mean we have to go home. My door is on the next floor. My roommate's still back at the party, probably getting drunk off his ass. I became aware of how quiet the dorms were. Everyone in our dormitory had been out partying that night or locked away in their rooms with headphones on or fast asleep. Like they were all aware of some danger that I wasn't like they left or hid from whatever was doomed to happen tonight. There was only one voice in the dorm that night. Stepmother was still pestering me in my ear and there were no other sounds to drown her out. She told me to go with him. He did something nice for me and I would be ungrateful to turn him down, wouldn't I? My eyes glanced down at the doorknob and I felt the key in my back pocket. Something was itching in the soles of my feet. I think I'll be fine, I said. Thank you.
There was something that passed across the huntsman's face, a drop of the eyebrows, a dimming in his eyes. I promise it's no inconvenience, he said. I don't get company over that much. Usually it's my roommate who brings friends and girls over. Not being by my lonesome sounds pretty nice, especially with a pretty girl. Even in the dim light, his face was teddy bear-like and he sounded like a golden retriever begging for a treat. But the itching in my foot wouldn't leave. The prickling in my neck was needle sharp. Maybe later, I said. I reached towards my pocket for the key and the huntsman grabbed my arm. When will later be, he asked. He said it like such a sincere question. His eyes were round and shimmering, but his fingers were tight enough on my arm to feel my heartbeat. I don't know, I said. Why would you walk home alone with me if you were just going to leave? You said you would walk me home. So you just left with some random guy you barely know? Why would you do something that dangerous if you didn't want something out of it? I'm just tired. I swear I'm not like the guys back there. I didn't put anything in your drink. I didn't try to do anything bad. So why are you acting like I'm the bad guy here? There was something cold in his voice and I didn't know where it came from. The dorm was too loud and there was no one there. I tried to pull away and he pulled me to his chest. He grabbed my chin and pointed my face up to his. If someone walked by, they might think this was a love confession. The ones where the man can't contain himself anymore and pulls the girl into a kiss. I see you every day in class, he said. You act so distant, like you think you're better than everyone else. But I know you're no different than any other tease on this whole campus, stringing along anyone who shows you any decency. To confuse matters more, he ran his fingers along my lips. He looked into the dark of my mouth, then pushed two fingers inside. His fingers were thin and pale. You could see blue veins running the length of his slender wrist and pulsing up his fingers, veins of red cushioned under skin with skin stretched over top. The tip of his middle finger reached the back of my throat and I snapped my front teeth through his bones. He realized what happened before I did. A screech tore down the empty hall. I could still feel two fingers in my mouth while he stumbled back against the wall. You fucking bitch, he cried. His eyes were wide as his whole arm shined crimson in the light. I knew if no one was coming for me, no one was coming for him either. No one rushes into the woods to stop a huntsman from hunting, so they never see him when he's devoured. I grabbed my fist in his curls and did what I see the boys at the party do to all the girls they invited over. I pushed his head to the side and bit my teeth into his neck. It seemed like my roommates were spending the night elsewhere. They were still gone when I finished bleaching and scrubbing the red from the hallway carpet. It was long past midnight and the sun was starting to creep over the horizon. I dragged the huntsman into my room by his shoulders and spent the early hours of the morning gnawing at whatever was left of him. The coppery taste was fuzzy on my tongue. By the time I was done, I was half asleep and my stomach was a dead weight threatening to drop me to the floor. I shut the door to my bathroom and looked down at myself. I would need to wash the dress before I gave it back to my roommate. I wondered for a second if this was what Red and her grandmother looked like crawling out of the wolf's stomach, if they dripped with red and fluid and oily purple meat. I looked in the mirror. I expected to see stepmother there, seeing her face hovering over my shoulder, scolding me for being so unfair to someone just trying to be nice, telling me if I had just turned him down gently, he would have let me go. But instead, I only saw my mother in her place, her eyes on the round protruding of my belly with a look of I told you so on her face. As I watched the blood trickle down the shower drain, I realized why my mother never told me about the huntsman. A world of wolves makes hunters of girls. And that's it. Wow, thank you so much. That was amazing. I always love hearing kind of inverted fairy tales. That was just such an amazing twist on the genre. And thank you so much for sharing with us. Um, so yeah, that's our reading for today. Thank you both again. Thank you to everyone for joining us. Um, if you all want to join us for our next Writers at Home, that will be on November 21st and will feature contributors to the fall edition of The Great Smokies Review. So again, thank you, Cassandra and Elizabeth, for sharing your work. Thank you, Mallow Crops, for hosting us. Uh, thank you to our audience, and we hope to see you in November. Thank you.